everyone. I am Devin and I will be presenting on the systemic barriers that exclude BIPOC authors from literary awards and then propose some solutions to evoke change. So this is some of the things I'll be going over is the introduction and kind of introduce the subject. I will be going through the case study specifically for the National Book Award for Fiction. I will then identify the barriers that BIPOC authors might experience and then propose solutions for change. So to start off with, um, this presentation was guided by this research question. What are the systemic barriers that exclude BIPOC authors from major literary awards? And using the scope of the National Book Award for Fiction, what can literary committees do to eliminate those barriers? So this research aims to one, provide an in-depth analysis of the National Book Award, two, identify the systemic barriers BIPOC authors might experience that become setbacks for being recognized in these literary awards, and three, the importance of racial diversity in industry executive positions. So it's all of us as book publishing professionals, it's no secret that there is a large racial gap between BIPOC publishing professionals and their white counterparts throughout the industry, not just with literary awards and authors. Uh, we are all maybe um, familiar with the Diversity Baseline Survey by Lee and Lowe Books. Uh, in 2019, they published that 76% of the publishing industry is white. The data collection specifically for them, illustrates the lack of diversity that is indicative of the barriers and gatekeeping of this industry. So I also want to preface for this presentation, I will be presenting data about authors' races and ethnicities. So to avoid presuming any author's identity based on names or perceived skin color, the background information is provided either by the National Book Award Foundation, uh, personal websites, and or printed biography books. So to take a deep dive into the National Book Award, um, it was established in 1936 by the American Book Awards, sorry, the National uh, American Book Association with the foundation category um, for fiction being first awarded in 1950. Um, their mission statement is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. So since the Fiction Awards creation, there have been about 70 different prize winners, nine repeat prize winners, and 376 finalists. In regards to racial diversity, the National Book Foundation has experienced some significant milestones over the decades. And here's some, um, an overview of their milestones. Um, since the foundation uh, was founded in 1936, they uh, first had the first award for fiction in 1950. The first African-American author awarded was Ralph Ellison for Invisible Man. And the first female to be awarded was Catherine A. Porter for Collected Stories. Um, the first African-American female was Alice Walker. Um, the first Asian-American was Ha Jin. Um, and the first Native American author awarded was Louise Eldridge for Salvage of Bones, or Salvage the Bones. And then um, the first multiracial author awarded was Singrid Nunes for The Friend in 2018. So I um, also wanted to uh, walk through some of the demographics for uh, the prize winners for the National Book Award for Fiction. As stated before, there were 70 different prize winners as of 2021. Up until 2011, the NBA uh, lacked overall diversity in award winners for this genre. So you will see um, the gender, about 27% were female and 72% were male. And then in the next graph over the race, um, there were significant differences in between the white counterparts and BIPOC authors. So um, from 1950 to 2010, 59 authors were prize winners. At the time, out of those prize winners, only 15 were female and four were BIPOC identified. And of those BIPOC, all of them were male identifying. 
Now, going back, going to 2011, out of those 10 prize winners, eight of them were BIPOC, and out of those eight, four of them were female identifying. So by splitting up this data analysis into sectioned years, it shows how diversity has changed drastically over a limited time frame. The data shows that more BIPOC authors were prize winners in the last 10 years than in the 60 years before. And now onto the barriers that BIPOC authors might experience. By identifying the barriers that inhibit BIPOC authors, literary committees can acknowledge them and dismantle any of those barriers. Um, keep in mind that many barriers stem from systemic and societal oppression that has created a domino effect into the publishing industry. So um, some of them are um, the history of systemic oppression and minority exclusion in the US. The publishing industry is or can be tied to the history of anti-literary laws, which made it illegal for African-American people and minorities, those enslaved and free to learn how to read or write. The culture of literature in the United States was built on Eurocentric stories and writers. In terms of book publishing, companies control the type of narratives that are published into our society. And the lack of diversity within the industry that we see today is attributed to this factor. Um, another barrier is institutionalized racism and implicit bias in the industry. Um, while this is not specific to the industry itself, it can be uh, tied to uh, the reason why there are a lack of BIPOC authors being recognized within these literary awards. Um, specific to literary committees, boards, and judges, it really depends on who is in the room. Um, another one is author credentials. So since the beginning of the National Book Award for Fiction, six out of the 70 prize winners were reported not to have attempted to go to college, must, much less obtain a college degree. Five of those prize winners were awarded before 1974. And the other authors who didn't have a degree dropped out at some point after being awarded. Um, within, with, with the avid you know, encouragement of um, higher education, especially in society today, and how we, you know, we place prestige on a higher education or a degree, uh, there's been a distinct pattern of prize winners with college degrees within the award. And um, so out of the 70 prize winners, 51 authors were either professors or lecturers at some point. And over half of them taught in an Ivy League college like Princeton, Yale, or Harvard. Um, this all kind of ties into the idea that it's an issue when it's only master degree holders who are in these elite circles who are then being awarded literary prize as literary prize winners. Um, the next one we have is tokenization. So the publishing industry, especially in today's society, is aware of the lack of diversity among its writers, professionals, and award winners. And um, whether it's intentional or not, there are many literary agents who believe that the publishing industry, quotes, covers up systemic racism that then makes it difficult for specifically Black authors to overcome the hurdles that white authors face. Um, by awarding a couple of BIPOC authors, it can be seen as solving, quote, the diversity issue, um, but only reaches the surface level of a larger systemic issue. Um, it's kind of tied to the idea um, of that, you know, we have a our Black fantasy author or we have an East Asian author. So that's kind of like it. That's it. We're set. Um, but that kind of mindset, of course, creates barriers for BIPOC authors in the future, especially within those demographics. And it also leaves a bad taste. And then the last one is um, the committee boards and the status quo itself. So some literary committees like the National Book Award um, have to read hundreds of submissions for authors and varying you know, backgrounds and education levels. Personal preference plays a huge factor in decision-making if the story evokes similar feelings or situations that the reader can relate to. Preference is, of course, you know, a, a culmination of 
multiple things ranging from personality to popular culture. The likelihood that a whole judging panel actually comes to a consensus is very, very low. Um, this is not to say that, you know, luck is a contributing factor, but the judges in the space make all the difference as to who gets awarded. So now I will be presenting some solutions for Larry committees and hopefully these solutions will also evoke change within the industry itself. Um, Larry awards can positively impact an author's reputation and career. So by amplifying the authors of these books, um, it inherently shapes what readers recognize as the culture of literature and within their respective genres. The following solutions are meant to dismantle societal barriers and structures to allow for equity within these literary awards. So here are the three solutions. So one of them is appointing BIPOC to executive positions. The presence of change starting with executive position creates a company norm of diverse working environment. The presence of more BIPOC in these executive roles leads to expanding who is encouraged and who is recognized within the industry and within literary awards because um, as we all know you know literary awards are very subjective whenever you are in a room or you are dealing with anything that is judging somebody for an award it is subjective um, a diverse judging panel serves as a cultural sounding board for underrepresented communities voices and when it especially when it comes to storytelling the next solution is affirmative action to affirming, affirming diversity. This solution could solve the lack of racial diversity on committee boards. It's shown that affirmative action has, quote, positive effects in equalizing employment rates for women and minorities. While there are many of you who might argue against affirmative action, this solution goes further in stating that you know, the National Book Award Foundation and other community boards should not only proactively implement an affirmative action plan, but also affirm diversity in their overall mission statement in order to foster an inclusive workplace environment. Um, affirmative action might be the first step, but the solution integrates being aware of possible individualized and institutional biases. And the last but not least one is enlarging the judge panel. So enlarging a judging panel in numbers and diverse experiences, whether that's um, educational, race, ethnic, uh, allows for more perspectives to be in the space and have a say in the decision-making process. An example of this is in 1986, Toni Morrison's book, Beloved, was a finalist, but um, lost to um, another book. While many readers were disappointed, the foundation, the National Book Foundation was, um, quote, embarrassed by this choice. Um, this led to the foundation enlarging the judge panel from three to five the following year. And they have since kept the same number of judges for every panel across all of their genres um, for the award. So by enlarging and diversifying the panel, it allows for different opinions and perspectives um, on the criteria that judges must base their votes on. This is also not to say that the uh, prize winner of that year did not deserve the award, but the National Book Foundation noticed the lack of consideration for Morrison's book that left them questioning not only the judging process, but who is in the room. So in, like I said, in any situation where judging takes place, it's, it's subjective. So to conclude, um, Larry Awards are controversial and highly political. They raise issues of gatekeeping, judgment, and representation, the stride to eliminate the barriers that BIPOC authors might experience in the industry and when being recognized for Larry Awards is an uphill battle that can't be solved overnight. Um, with the rise of movements like Black Lives Matter and We Need Diverse Books, the change of diversity within the industry is erupting. The movement toward diversity has long been held by the belief that only BIPOC individuals are responsible for making the change, but it also must be a change that the collective instills. 
Thank you, everyone. So this presentation was based on uh, my master's thesis. Um, you can read the master's thesis published by PBX Scholar. Um, and if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Devin. We, uh, Thank you. Uh, we'll take questions uh, at, at the end. First, we're going to hear from Jen. Yeah, let me just make sure that the folks online can see it too, because yeah. they need to see your presentation as well. Thank you to Devin, by the way, because we kind of switched the order a little last minute. So thank you, Devin, for <laughs> thank you for being accommodating on it. Uh, so hi everyone. It is my privilege and pleasure to sort of bookend the conference today. I uh, did a plenary with Kim Sharif earlier this morning. So thank you all for coming and being here for that. My name is Tina Donnelly. I'm a managing editorial assistant at Penguin Random House. I work in the audio division and I'm a recent graduate of the GW publishing program. So, all right, let's get started today. I'm gonna to be talking about gatekeeping in publishing. We're basically gonna uh, focus on some specific parameters and uh, policies that are currently in place that kind of made the industry as homogeneous as it is today and what we can do to kind of rectify the situation. So a little bit of context, this uh, presentation is going to be looking at gatekeeping and publishing specifically through the lens of publishing in the age of Black Lives Matter movement uh, in response to kind of the growing awareness of both police brutality and uh, more sy uh, systemic racism in the workplace. Uh, a lot of publishers kind of across the nation have released uh, DNI statements and uh, equity and inclusion statements kind of um, uh, just kind of saying that they want to be more diverse and that they want to help dismantle these uh, racist um, systems that are currently in place. So I think uh, the Black Lives Matter movement was sort of somewhat of a wake up call, I think, to a lot of people, but specifically the publishing industry, that perhaps the situation of representation in the workforce is a lot more dire than we had thought. Mm -hmm. And um, and what we should start doing to kind of rectify the situation. So these are, like I said, a lot of publishers have kind of released diversity and inclusion statements. These are just uh, four of the top five uh, publishers and just some snippets from their uh, statements which were released publicly. And as you can see, they all kind of follow the same language. I, I hope everyone can read it, but they all kind of have the same language. We must do more to dismantle systems of racial injustice. We stand against racism in the workplace and we want to be more diverse and inclusive. So they all kind of follow the same language and they all kind of have the same idea and the same goal. But and, I, and as great as these statements are, and I think they are really important to kind of outline the publisher's goals, they, they aren't, if anyone has read several of them, they aren't always super specific. So what exactly is being done to dismantle these racist systems? So in short, for our introduction, many publishers, big and small, have made promises to work towards a more inclusive and diverse industry in the coming years. So gatekeeping in the industry. What is gatekeeping? Gatekeeping is the act of controlling or intentionally limiting the access to something. And publishers act as gatekeepers by limiting access to publishing careers uh, for marginalized groups, information to publishing or ability to get published or to work in the publishing industry and information about careers and whatnot. So to give just a couple of specific examples of gatekeeping in the publishing industry and how exactly they are kind of keeping the industry from being as diverse as it could be, we're just gonna look at a couple of different examples of things that are put in place. So this is a very condensed version of the publishing hierarchy. You know, everyone here kind of knows the, the publishing hierarchy, we're no strangers to it, but this is kind of a condensed simplified version. The author has to get an agent. The agent talks to the acquiring editor and the acquiring editor brings it to the publisher who has the final say on the manuscript. So right off the bat, there are several there are several people that you have to go through. There are like obstacles. There are a lot of hoops to jump through and not necessarily 
needlessly so like we we all know and again this is a condensed version there are several several different department heads that the manuscript has to be run by several different people and several different areas of the company that need to sign off on it and this is very condensed and and simplified um and all of those jobs do have a purpose and do have a function, but it is true that they it's still a hurdle. It is something to go through that, um, that, that one has to go through to either work in the publishing industry or be published. So again, just kind of a quick condensed look at the publishing process. An author uh, must find an agent. The agent has to find a publisher to pick up the manuscript. Then it goes into editing and after it has gone through editing, revision, and printing, it is finally published. And this can take anywhere from two to three years. So this is kind of a lengthy process. And so again, this is all you know part of the process. It needs to go through those things in order to make a quality book, right? But the, the thing that I think needs to be realized here is that it is a process. There are hurdles to jump. There are people to please and obstacles to go through. And People from underrepresented groups or say marginalized groups might not have the access to the time or funds that it takes to commit to a process like this that say more privileged people might have. And that doesn't mean we have to completely override and change the publishing process, but it does mean that we need to give more attention to people that might have a harder time going through this process. And this is the one I want to focus on the most. I think this deserves... A lot, of, a lot of attention because it's something I believe is really, really important. And this was somewhat touched upon in the invisible uh, uh, disability uh, presentation that we talked about. So these are the general requirements for entry level positions. Uh, entry level, you know, the first position you can get, start in, in the company and, and get in the company. So from Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Hachette, Workman Publishing, Scholastic, and Candlewick. Right off the bat, you can, you can see the same thing in every single one under general requirements, which is publishing experience preferred. In every single one, they, I, I, I don't think I found any that didn't say publishing experience preferred or publishing internship preferred or, you know, some, something along those lines. And I am a, I'm surprised that this hasn't been talked about a little bit more. I'm so happy that it was brought up in the Invisible Disability um, uh, panel, but basically this is very problematic. This is uh, kind of um, disturbing in a, a, a kind of um, a sense because number one, it's under requirements. And so, and so a lot of people say, well, it doesn't say it's necessarily required. It's publishing experience preferred. We're not saying it's required, but we would like you to have it. But right away, the language is suggesting that if you don't have publishing experience, your ap application isn't even going to get looked at, that another candidate is going to have publishing experience and they're always going to go with them because that's what you prefer. So right away, it's scaring away a lot of people and discouraging them from applying. But I think what is the most important takeaway here is we have a rare example of a real life catch-22 where across the board, Publishers have said, you know, so much about how we want to make the industry more diverse. We want to be more inclusive. We want to expand our diversity. And yet simultaneously, they are saying they prefer to hire from people who are already within the industry. How can you make the industry more diverse if you are saying we prefer to hire people who are already within that industry? That's somewhat of a catch-22. You can't do both. So this is something I think, um, and I want to, um, to clarify, I don't think we should, I, I think the requirements need to be looked at a little bit more as in, um, like, do you really need publishing experience? Is that really a requirement for this? Maybe it is for, for a lot of position, positions, absolutely. But is it, is it really required for, for every position? I can personally attest to this because I started my publishing journey at Penguin Random House with no prior publishing experience. I didn't have any publishing internship. I had no experience working in publishing. I didn't start the program yet, so I wasn't even in the program. But I started in publishing. They, they invested in me and trained me on the job, and I think I fared perfectly fine. So I can attest personally that publishing experience might not necessarily be required for all positions. And this isn't about changing the requirements or 
you know, maybe lowering qualifications so it can be open to more people. It's about being more realistic and in that way, encouraging people who might otherwise be perfectly qualified to work in the publishing industry, especially because there is so much training on the job. So those are a couple of examples of current gatekeeping practices that are keeping the industry from being uh, more diverse and more inclusive. And as I already said, a lot of those things are there for a reason. We, we do need all of those people in the hierarchy. That process of getting published is a process for a reason. So it's not necessarily about changing the way the publishing industry works as it is about championing, championing underrepresented groups and, you know, making them more feel like they can apply and feel like they are more welcome. So that is some current uh, uh, practices of gatekeeping, some examples. So let's look at the picture so far, where we're at now. Those are the examples publishers across the board have talked about wanting to be more diverse. So what are, what are we at right now? So despite claims of wanting a more diverse workforce, the publishing industry remains very difficult to break into, especially for marginalized groups, because again, they might not have the access to time and funds that it takes to get into the industry. So let's take a look at diversity in the publishing workforce. We've seen a lot of these numbers today, and these are kind of along the the same vein, but so this is across the board, not just at like Penguin Random House, this is across the board. So as we can see, the numbers are pretty low. This is the percentages of uh, Black, Latinx, and Asian workers in the industry across the board. Starting in 2005, it's, it's pretty low, but we get a little bit of growth in 2010, and then some more in 2015, it's looking kind of promising. And then somewhere around 2018, 2019, the progress starts to taper off a little bit. It's not, it's growing slowly, but the growth is there. And then suddenly the growth kind of stops. There's a, there's a growth in the, the percentages of, of Black workers, but not in Latinx and the Asian workers. So kind of what happened, I think maybe perhaps efforts had kind of tapered off a little bit, or people became less passionate about it, or they saw that the numbers grew and they figured, well, that's good. We, you know, we got more diverse workers. So, you know, that's okay. And as you can see, it wasn't even that too much growth. Like, as you can see, I had to blow up the numbers quite a bit <laughs> to show the minuscule growth um, of percentages. So that is the diversity in the publishing workforce at large. Let's take a look at the diversity levels in the publishing output, like the content that we are putting out. This is the diversity in children's books uh, numbers from 2018. So it's a snapshot from 2018. So it's a couple years old, but we can probably agree that it's, it's still a little uh, relevant, I think, and probably still pretty accurate. So right off the bat, 50% of uh, this is like characters in, in children's books, like who is being represented in children's literature specifically. So right off the bat, we got 50% of white people. And then we go down to 27% for animals slash other, 10% African, African American, 7% for Asian Pacific Islander, Asian Pacific American, 5%, sorry, I can't really see it, 5% for Latinx and only 1% of American Indian slash First Nation. So first of all, it's kind of, I find it a little upsetting that the second biggest group isn't even a person, it's animal slash other. And then uh, this, so these numbers are concerning for several reasons, not the least of which is that lifelong readership starts in childhood. And as publishers, it, we want to create lifelong readers. That's kind of our, our whole mission statement. And it is, uh, we are, it's our goal as publishers and it's our responsibility as publishers to make stories for everyone, you know, to, for everyone to read. Kim touched upon this a lot in our conversation this morning, but also it's, it's troubling also because it is no secret that the earlier children read and the more children read, the more advantageous it is to them socially, personally, academically, intellectually, emotionally. So we really need to be a little bit more responsible in who we are representing. We should, again, we should be making stories for everyone, every single person, not, you know, 50% of one group of people. So 
those are the current gatekeeping policies that we have in place. That's where the industry is at right now. So where do we go from here? We've already talked a lot about this, I, I think, today, and I'm just going to talk some more about it. And uh, I, we got a lot of good information on this with our conversation with Kim earlier today. This is going to kind of be a recap because, again, I, I interviewed her for this presentation. Uh, so where where do we go from here? We know where the numbers are at and where our diversity levels are, and we know that they're not where we want them to be. So what are some specific things that everyone can do to, uh, to achieve this goal and work towards it. So in order to find that out, I had a conversation. I interviewed uh, Kim Sharif, who we spoke with earlier today. She's the Executive Vice President, Director of Strategy for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Penguin Random House, which was a, a position created specifically for her. And just to tie back to my um, a value of not necessarily having publishing experience, Kim did not have any publishing experience when she came to Penguin Random House, and she is still doing a lot of great work. So she mentioned this earlier, and I just want to reiterate this, that I, I asked her, I was like, what do we do? What do we like? What are we supposed to do to make the industry more diverse? What are we supposed to do? And she said, there is no one size fits all for there's no like one answer. Every company, every community, every environment has to look at the status quo in their in their environment and see what is needed and kind of curate a culture around that and kind of address specific because everyone, every company is going to have different problems and is going to need probably different solutions. So unfortunately, it's, it's, a, it's a complex issue and it's not going to have a simple solution. It's not a simple issue. It's not going to have a simple solution. It's going to have a complex solution that's going to take a lot of time and effort and planning and thinking and introspection on all of our parts. So again, we, we kind of spoke about this already, but I asked her, what are your goals for Penguin Random House? And she spoke about having a more diverse workforce, avoiding homogeneity, creating a, com a company culture where underrepresented people feel comfortable speaking up, investing in hiring managers and leaders. We'll touch upon that a little bit more in a couple of minutes, but uh, investing in hiring managers and leaders and ensuring a sense of psychological safety and belonging. I think this one is really important just because um, I think it's something that maybe more people from probably more privileged groups maybe take um, take for granted. But I think just something simple that every publisher, publishing professional can do is just ensuring a sense of, you know, belonging of like making sure to extend that welcome to underrepresented groups and kind of just giving the attitude that like, yes, we want you here like this. We want you here. We want you to be a part of our community. Uh, another um, thing to know she talked about was uh, knowing the right questions to ask. Um, so it, it's not just about um, kind of saying like, what can, what can we do? But it's about saying, what, can, what is currently being done right now? What more can be done? What can I as an individual do? I think not only knowing the right questions to ask your company or your coworkers or your supervisors, but knowing the right questions to ask yourself. Why do I feel this way about something? Why did I have that reaction? Is it possibly connected to an internal bias or possibly an unseen prejudice that I have? It's, it's about knowing the right questions to ask in general, but also I think knowing specifically and importantly, knowing the right questions to ask yourself and to be critical and introspective of yourself and your own actions and your own reactions to things. So kind of going back to, and this is specifically, I want to uh, kind of clarify, this is specifically at Penguin Random House uh, where I work, uh, where I have kind of, I'm privy to kind of what is being done for us specifically. So, and Kim talked about this, but training hiring managers to pull from a more diverse slate of candidates. candidates. And again, I want to clarify um, this is not just hiring diverse people for the sake of just hiring someone who can make the industry look more diverse. It's about hiring a more diversity of perspective and diversity of skill. And it's about kind of being a little bit more realistic with the general job requirements and training hiring managers to to kind of look at uh, candidates and applications a little bit differently and focus less on like, well, do you have publishing experience? Do you have a degree in publishing and more? What do you have that, what do you, what can you bring to the table basically? And just being, we talked about this earlier today, 
but just being more realistic about the requirements and what really needs to be required to be in a certain position. Uh, spreading an aggressive and radical welcome, again, being very vocal and very assertive about like, yes, we want you here. We want you to at least, we want you to be here. We want you to at least apply. We want you to think about a career in publishing because we do want, uh, we want a diversity of people to, to come and, and work with us and help make books. Uh, creating a more inclusive and welcoming company culture, just being there to, to listen and, and to represent people who might not be as represented as they should. And like I said, aim for a diversity. It's, it's not just about, and, and this is something Kim told me, not just about a diversity of, say, race, but aiming for a diversity of opinion, a diversity of perspective, and a diversity of skill, and understanding that those things can come from all walks of life and from all different kinds of experiences and all different kinds of career paths, and not necessarily just one. So this is a look at, uh, in response to what Kim is kind of doing now, we're going to take a look at the hiring statistics at Penguin Random House. Uh, so this is kind of like a snapshot of our hiring statistics since 2016 all the way up to 2021. So first of all, I think it's pretty good that we cut the percentage of just white people that are hired almost in half from 79% to 48%. It was cut almost in half. And as you can see, we're hiring each year hiring a little bit more of a diverse slate of people, which means we're hiring a diverse people who come from different walks of life. People are going to have different experiences, who, people who are going to be able to add overall just more to the process. They're going to be able to offer more when it comes to uh, deciding what titles to publish, deciding what titles to do special marketing campaigns on. Just the, the more diverse slate of a people we're going to have, the more the, the stronger our approach is going to be and the stronger our slate of titles is going to be. So as you can see, you're getting a little bit more diverse every single, every single time. So in conclusion, kind of focusing on impact over intention, it doesn't really matter if we have good intentions in our, in our diversity statements, what exactly is being done. So this is kind of another snapshot from Penguin Random House. In September of 2020, they released the we released these statistics about our current makeup. So non-warehouse and warehouse uh, percentages. Again, it's overwhelmingly white. 78% is a pretty big chunk in our non our offices, basically our office job. So that's kind of what our specifically Penguin Random House. This isn't across the board. This is specifically Penguin Random House in 2020. And then um, we released our, just recently, we released this for the year 2021. And so as you can see, there is, there's a little bit of, of growth. Now uh, our, our percentages of employees are only 74% white. So that's a little bit more growth. And uh, the growth of diversity and the rate of the, di the diversity growth is small, but it is there. It's slight and the, um, the growth is promising if, if small and perhaps not at the rate that we really want it to be. But I believe that the more we understand the current parameters that are in our industry, the current things that are making the country, the, sorry, the company and the industry less diverse, the more we can work towards this goal, the more we can do to make it a little bit more diverse and the quicker we can reach this, the, the, we can make this pace go a little bit quicker. So lastly, what can we do? What specifically can we do as individuals, as companies? I think as an individual, it's pretty important just to participate, participate in anything and everything that interests you and not just your company, but in your community, in your neighborhood, in your environment, get involved and volunteer and talk to people and, and see what's going on and read articles and, and see what's going on in not just the, in your company, but maybe the industry over, overall and in your community read, 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 read frequently and broadly and read different stories and different perspectives. Read a book by an author you never heard of. Try, try do it in, or just like read someone that you, that you haven't heard of that isn't on the New York times bestseller list. You know, read a, read a book that you've never heard of, read a book that takes place in another country or, or something and just 
read different stories and different perspectives and listen. I think this is the most important thing. Listen, listen to BIPOC colleagues, listen to ideas and feelings without judgment and bias. This is easier said than done. Uh, this is where knowing the right questions to ask comes into. If you are listening to someone and maybe you have maybe not a great reaction, a negative reaction, ask yourself, why, why did I react that way? Is it, is it possibly tied to an internal bias? And be critical of yourself as well as others and listen to communicate and to understand. So that is my presentation. I wanted to say again, a special thank you to Kim Cherie for talking with us and, and for talking with me and helping me put this presentation together. She gave me a lot of feedback. She kind of helped me out with uh, on what to focus on. So, so thank you. We might have time for one or two questions. We're kind of almost at time, but who just has their hand up? Do you have a question? For yes, I have a question from right. the online audience. All right. The diversity in output content with respect to children's books is very interesting, unfortunately not so surprising. Is it fair to say that as we increase diversity in authors contributing content, it will increase diversity in the content itself? Probably the same applies to inclusion. Um, sorry. Um, personally, I, I believe so, just from having, from my personal experience with Penguin Random House and from what my colleagues and coworkers have told me, that the, the more, the more, the higher the, the diversity of our authors, our content is just automatically going to be more diverse because they are going to have different stories to talk about. They're going to have different stories to tell. Um, and it's something that like I personally kind of kind of personally realized that not, not just having diverse authors, but I think having diverse acquisition editors and maybe uh, like publishers is really important because they're the ones who ultimately pass off on whether something gets published or not. And so the more diverse they are, they might be able to see value in a story that someone else might not see the value in because that doesn't, that's not their experience. They might not think it's realistic or they might not see the value in it or, or, or anything, but maybe someone from a different walk of life might see how, like, no, there's an audience for this. This will, this will speak to people of a certain of a of a certain group or whatever, but um, yeah, I absolutely think the the more uh, diverse the both not just the authors but the workforce as well because they're the ones who help sign off on things and help market things and help uh, do the advertising and all of the social media for it. The more diverse um, the workforce and the authors are going to be, the more diverse the work output it is going to be. Any other questions from the um, question here? I don't think I need one. Yeah, for the, the record. First of all, thank you. Uh, you both of your presentations, but especially this one, your passion and your authentic interest in this is incredible. And to have all of the data to back up and, and to actually make an impact, it's just awesome. And I appreciate both of them. Um, what else was I going to say? <laughs> that, uh, oh yeah, Kim mentioned this morning that one of the goals is to have your employee demographic near the demographic of the United States. And I'm just, I don't know enough. I want, how close are you all to that? And what happens after you reach that goal? Um, Uh, I think we're closer to it, but we're not. I, I off the top of my head, I don't know the exact statistics of the the makeup of the United States. I have like a rough idea, and I know that we are not there yet, but we are getting closer. Um, I, I again, I have I have a very very like rough idea of what the uh, population looks like, and I know that we're pretty close. Uh, personally, I think. I'm not sure really what will happen when we hit that. I think it's going to be a while. And I think personally, I think the efforts will switch to, okay, now maintaining that level. Maybe, maybe it's possible to scale back a little bit on the recruitment side, both for authors and for workers and be like, okay, we, we reflect the United States population pretty well. Now let's focus on our efforts on maintaining that, that and um and also i think just continuing to publish the same like the same amount or more or if not more 
of like diverse stories because you know I, I just think you can never have enough and and you know if it's a good story it can come from anywhere so I don't think as far as publishing on the content side I don't think there's any reason to scale back our efforts on publishing stories but perhaps on the recruitment side maybe I believe then it's like okay we met the what I would do at least is we met our quota now let's make sure their careers are growing that they are that we're investing in them that we're doing that we're doing we're offering training and resources and perks and you know and all sorts of extra benefits and like now we're going to work on maintaining that level of diversity and also investing in them so they feel like like they can grow in the in the company and not just well we hired you on so you know you're here that's all we need but like making sure that they they're growing in the company too thank you Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, Tina, and thank you, Devin, for this great presentation to close us off today. Uh, I do want to say just a few thank yous before we go. Um, I want to thank, first of all, all of our presenters today. We've had heard from a number of presenters. Uh, maybe here in the audience we could give a round of applause. And I also want to thank everybody that attended both in person and online. It was great to have everybody. Uh, I want to make a special thanks to my friend and co-organizer, Pooja Telekacherla, who we now will call Pooja Telekacherla. Uh, it's been great helping. Uh, this, this is our third year doing this together. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, this, the staff of CPS, the College of Professional Studies, uh, Dean Riddle, who was here today, uh, also the marketing team, Amy Stark, Amanda Gillespie. Uh, I'd like to thank Cheryl Scott Muzon, who was here earlier today, uh, our recruiter, and uh, also here in the Churchill Center, Justin Reich and Alice Abbott Havers, uh, who helped out with this beautiful room and the technology and everything. Uh, also, with the technology, I'd like to thank the team at Platform Q that hosted the event online, uh, especially team lead Brian Whalen. Um, and I'd like to thank our sponsors again, uh, the Association of University Presses. Peter Berkeley has been here all day. Thanks, Peter. Uh, also, Society of Scholarly Publishing and the Association of American Publishers. And I'd like to thank our great professors who really make this program at GW a success and they help impact the lives of students like Tina and Isabella and many others and, and our amazing students uh, who really are the future leaders of publishing. So thank you all for coming.